ask you yeah. the question, okay, and then I'll answer it. Yeah, right. myself as well, and then ask you the second one. Two things, Rob. Can you just move that? Uh, so bar? you ask me the question, I'll answer it, yeah. then you'll answer yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're live now, guys, for the Facebook community. Hi, everyone, in Progressive and on the Rob Moore uh, Facebook page. Uh, we're live, so this is a rare interview. It's very rare that Mark and I get together anymore. Mark's busy buying massive buildings. I'm busy doing crazy stuff. Um, but our PR company has asked us to do an interview for Just Entrepreneurs, which is a big entrepreneurial website. Uh, and we thought, well, why don't we do a bit of leverage and do a live feed um, rather than sitting in our office writing it out. So I've got a list of 11 questions that we've been asked by our PR company that will be published for entrepreneurs. So, should we get started? Everyone yep. ready? Cool. Yeah? 11 questions after one minute. I'm yep. going to do this right. so you know to wrap up. Okay. All right. So we are live on Rob Moore and Progressive Property. You're live on both now. So, give us a thumb up, give us a hi, tell us where you're from, uh, and let's get started. So, uh, well, let me just say. Yeah. Oh, you want to say, oh, sorry, we've got to do the official stuff. One, take one, Mark. Ooh, look at us, professionals. Remember, this camera here, Rob. If you want to go oh, it. sorry, look at that camera. All right, so, hi, Mark and Rob. Uh, thank you for taking part. Please tell us about the co-founders of Progressive. So, Mark, one minute on yourself. Well, I love buying property. I love doing property deals. I love investment. Um, we started this just over 10 years ago. Uh, prior to that, I made quite a few investments in residential property made quite a lot of mistakes um, and uh, just settled on a, a principle of buying little sort of ex-local authority properties which we could refurbish and mm. um, start to do it for clients, train other people how to do it. Um, yeah, and, and now I get to do scaled up versions of that. So, you know, I'll take commercial buildings, uh, convert them, um, doing a, a sort of new build project at the moment on top of another building. Yeah. Uh, quite like keeping stuff. Quite like the long term, you know, utilising low interest rates and sort of getting high yields and, 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 and making the money off, off the margin in between. Yeah. Uh, really believe in, in the residential growth story in the UK yeah. um, and, and just want to maximise on that. And fair to say you've been in business since you were in your teens? So yeah, you so I sort of had the odd thing running, you know, since I was probably 15, something like that. And my, my dad just drummed investment into me right back then. Yeah. And did, it was it economics you did at uni? Yeah, international business economics, yeah. Yeah, okay, and um, pretty much had your own business since then. Various different, as the Americans call, side hustles. Yeah, well, I went on a graduate scheme for a bit, but yeah, yeah. other than that, um, yeah, I've been doing my own stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm Rob Moore. I co-founded Progressive with Mark in, we Jan 07 we incorporated, didn't we? We did, yeah. And we met December 05, stroke early 06. Worked for a property investment company for nine months. Probably fair to say I convinced you to quit. I think that's a, a fair summary, Rob. Yeah. Uh, I did architecture at uni but did nothing with it. Complete waste of my time, although I had fun. I set up uh, as an artist, kind of. Didn't really make any, well, got myself in debt. Was a pub landlord, didn't really make it work. But property definitely saved me. Um, so I was in, what, mid to late 20s, 26, 27 when we started that. Uh, yeah, now I run a podcast called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Mark and I run and co-own Progressive Property Unlimited Success, Progressive Let's, Progressive Property Network. Um, business is what we do and we love. Uh, I'm more the sort of strategy, vision, ideas, big picture side of the business. Mark is more the operations, tactics, um, analysis, research, cost savings, and I think that's probably why our partnership's endured over the last 10 or 11 years. Uh, all right, so that's question one. Um, when did you decide that progressive property, you know, and, and our partnership was the right thing to do? Well, I think you know it was it was probably a few months before we set it up. Um, you and I got to work together, and I got to see how we interacted. You, know, you were testing the, me, yeah, weren't you? <laughs> all, the, all the all the sort of um, you know extra work you put in, you know, out of hours, all the books you read, all the marketing stuff you learned about. That really impressed me, yeah. uh, and I knew that if we had a business together, you know, if you'd done that in three months, well, what, what are you going to be able to do in the next 30, 40 years? Yeah. So for me, that was a, a seminal moment, and, yeah. uh, and, and I thought we've got to have this, this thing together, yeah. yeah. So I think I decided it was the right thing when um, property really saved me from myself, so I was struggling as an artist, I was in debt, uh, and then I got into property, and when I got into property, I didn't actually intend to quit everything tomorrow, 
I think that's sometimes bad advice. I intended to paint in the day and carry on my existing business. Sorry, paint in the night and carry on my existing business and do property in the day. And I started doing property in the day, but property started to work for me, so I never painted again. And Mark helped me get a job at a property investment company. Mark had been in, I think you'd been about a year there, hadn't you? And you kind of were saying, hey, look, we should hire this guy. And you really helped me along there. And I never really intended to necessarily just do my own, our own thing forever. I didn't really know where I was going. I just knew the property looked good. But you taught me some of the mistakes. You protected me from our boss who was ultimately making some mistakes. And then in August of 2006, when I realised that what he was doing was wrong, and what we wanted to do, which, which was smaller existing properties, that was when I thought we have to leave. And that was when I started hounding you that we have to leave. And I think, well, I managed to get fired. So that, that it, it worked out in the end. All right, so number three, question three is, do you remember your initial reaction when you thought, yes, this business is working, you know, property is working? Because I think we bought about 20 in the first year, but evenings and weekends kind of, I wouldn't say behind our boss's back, but do you remember when I was talking on stage and um, you found out? Well, that, that, that would have been a moment uh, yeah. which, um, which indicated that the, the, the system was working. I think you jumped on stage and we, I think you said we bought 11 together or 15 yeah. together or something like that. And the look on his face was just unbelievable because yeah. it was such a short period of time. Yeah. He couldn't believe that we'd been able to do that. Um, I think he was a bit annoyed, were not he? He was annoyed and you know, it, it, uh, he realised that actually the strategy we were using and the, yeah. the method we were using was, was probably better than... Yeah. Than, than what he was used to. I mean, I think it's important to say we didn't have any exclusivities or anything in the contract. We said, we said we couldn't, so we could, and we did. Uh, and also, we approached him with this model, didn't we? Because at the time, it was overseas, off plan, which you tried in the early years and hadn't worked out. And we presented this new model to him and didn't, weren't really interested. And then when he found out how many we bought, he was interested. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny how it happened. I think um, I, I realised it was working... Yeah, probably towards the end of 2006, where um, I didn't expect to buy that many that quick. And we kind of burned through your money, and we were burning through your mum's money, and we were burning through your stepdad's money. Um, but pretty quickly, we were able to compare it to the overseas, the off-plan, the new build stuff that you'd protected me from. And it was actually producing cash flow rather than costing money. All right, so question four is, how do we, progressive, us set ourselves apart from the competitors? Well, I think we're very innovative in terms of new strategies. So as one door closes, you know, tax changes come along or maybe lending gets more difficult or there's, there's some other issue in the marketplace. We're very in innovative to sort of bring new strategies to the mm. fore, which uh, people can use. So obviously the last few years with commercial conversion, with permitted development, we've introduced that. Service accommodation has been a really big thing. Mm. Introduced a lot of that. <coughs> Years ago, it was lease options. So, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then, of course, you've got the um, the sort of bedrock strategies like I don't know HMO or, or single let, which which I particularly like. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think a lot of it is about truth, uh, yeah. and it's about the realities of what works. <coughs> <coughs> You have to excuse me, I'm not very well at the moment. <coughs> so, I'm always very passionate about finding an investment strategy or an investment system that, that works yeah. and provides the highest return yeah. over a long period of time. And, you know, I, I get very excited by that. Yeah. So, you know, at the core of everything we do, all of these strategies are done by ourselves, tested by yeah. you know, our trainers, and uh, you know, within our community, there are loads of people doing them, so, uh, yeah. so it's about the realities of, of walking the walk as well. Sure. So basically you're saying we do and we teach, we don't just teach, yeah. which is very important. We always test on ourselves or our close JV partners, um, so you know, we're testing service accommodations in our own units before we're going to um, you know, introduce this course out to the masses, I think that's really important. I think our values ultimately differentiate from the competitors, so our values are progressive, innovative and personal. Now obviously Mark's talked about innovative. And it's easy to be innovative when you're in tech or apps, but in the property world, it's, people are very traditional, doing things a traditional way, you know, putting deposits in or buying cash and waiting a long time and renting them out and just doing your standard thing. 
Whereas at Progressive, we've been very different. We've created innovative strategies, brought them to market, new ways of doing things. So um, I think we've evolved a lot over the last decade when a lot of traditional investors, as soon as the lending changes or the rates change or um, you know, there's a, a change with the buy-to-let rules or whatever, um, the traditional investors just kind of give up and go and do something else. Also, we're very accessible, as you know. Uh, you're tuning in live to the communities. You know, like I don't have someone else operating my, operating my Facebook account. It's us when we make our posts. We want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to be close to you. Uh, and I think the community in Progressive is something that we've created that I think is unrivaled in any other uh, the property or training businesses in the UK. Um, so that's, you know, that's probably what differentiates us. Okay, so Mark, uh, what do you think about starting business on a budget? Do you think that it's good to start and you know, basically spend no money? Or do you think it's good to try and get uh, financed and raise money? I think um, the way I've almost always started a business is very small, organically, on a shoestring. Because you're tight. Uh, thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and just sort of grow it and build it from there. That I really believe in that because I just think you start the right way, you you, you build up the, the, the different assets and the different things in the business um, based on what's working and yeah. what's generating revenue rather than some sort of synthetic finance which suddenly builds this thing up and you know buys a load of stuff in but isn't necessarily uh, focusing capital in the, in the right direction and yeah. in a proven direction that actually works and it has been tested sure so fine if you've got a lot of experience in business and you just want to grow something and, and not reinvent the wheel and keep doing what you've already done before maybe you do get some finance to spend on on certain things I don't know a machine or, or whatever but I think a lot of the time certainly with you know, these, these kind of trading businesses uh, that, that aren't capital intensive, I think it's good not to finance and yeah. to, to grow them organically. Mm. Yeah. So the, the, in America, they call it bootstrapping, you know, basically where you start on a shoestring or a bootstrap. Uh, I think I've got a caveat to that. I think we started in business, we've got no finance on our business, no debt on our business other than maybe, you know, a few sort of lease cars in lets and stuff, but basically no debt. And the great thing about that is it doesn't stress your overhead. Uh, and the more debt you put on the business, you stress your overhead. And also, you, you raise money in the business and you're selling shares. Where you, when you take profits, they're thinned out. Um, but if you're a tech business and you need 2 million or 5 million quid to create your product in the first place, in that kind of business, it probably is smart to raise some capital because you might not have it. But any business that you start where you don't need to spend millions to create your product or your service or your idea, why not start? I mean, we, I think we, we both agreed cause to sort of, as our method of commitment, I think we stuck 200 quid in the bank, didn't we? Yeah, it was something like yeah, that. Yeah, and you had it in credit, and I had to put it on my credit card. Um, so, yeah, we completely, uh, as they say, bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. And it worked for us because we always had leanness in our business. We didn't have this <coughs> huge overhead. So, you know, if we, it, it takes you a bit of time, but there's no extra stress. And, you know, when we make, sell, some, sell 30 grand worth of product, we can take a little bit of a drawing of 1,500 quid or two grand, and you can... And you can grow with all that without all that stress. It also teaches you how to keep costs down. Because everyone spends someone else's money freer and easier than their own money. So if you raise a load of money for your business, you, you're not going to be able to help but think, oh yeah, we need furniture, we need equipment, we need fancy stuff, we need this, we need that. Because it's not your hard-earned tax paid money. So most of the time I'd say give it a go on your own, teaching you the good uh, principles of business. All right then. So Mark. Now, this is quite an ironic question for you, because I know you will. How do you relax when you're not running progressive in your businesses? How do I not relax? very easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, I've got a lot on. Uh, and I've probably put myself back in that position again. Uh, with, um, yeah, with, 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 de with a deal. You've gone and bought a massive deal. Yeah. yeah. So, clearly, that's taken a lot of my time up. Um, but, uh, yeah, weekends, I like to just sort of, you know, go walking. Uh, I like to go fly, um, you know, it can be slightly stressful in the air, but generally afterwards I find it quite fulfilling and, yeah. and relaxing, spending time with, with Gemma and the dog. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoy that. We live in a, a little town and, and we just sort of walk around all the cafes and yeah. the, the pubs and um, in your wax really, jacket. we really enjoy that yeah. <laughs> yeah. at the weekends. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's how I relax. I mean, running is awesome and, you know, exercise for me mm. clears my head. Yeah. Uh, and relaxes me as well. Sure. Um, so that's just a key part of my day. Yeah. yeah. 
So I've always found relaxing quite hard because I'm always on it. And you're right there, Tom. I've yes. only just started. Why are you telling me to wind up? No, Let no. me have a go. It's one minute. <laughs> you know you can well, go right, one minute. So yeah, I've always found it difficult to unwind and relax because I love business so much. I love property so much. I love doing the podcast. I love doing these live feed videos. You know, I, I love reading, listening to podcasts, etc. all the time. So for me, relaxation is not something I particularly need. But what I find is I take little time in the day where I don't put pressure on myself. So I, I went for a 37 kilometer cycle ride this morning, which I'm finding that quite fun at the moment. My podcast for me is Passion Profession Merge. It's something I enjoy doing. I play golf with my son. My son is a probably, he's in, definitely in the top three best six-year-old golfers in the world at the moment. And I think he's got a good chance of winning the world champion. So I love doing that. I love uh, being with my family. Uh, and, um, but I love listening to audiobooks, watching autobiographies. You, know, you watched the McDonald's documentary recently, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I really enjoy that. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, and I love doing things like yeah. that to relax because it's kind of like passion, profession, merge. Because you love, you know, you enjoy watching films, but if you watch something that's educational um, and inspiring, you kind of get that merge. So for me, I don't have anything to run away from. I don't have a job to relax from or turn my back on. So it's not really something I feel like I need to do. Um, yeah. All right, great. So. How could a twenty? This is a very specific question. How could a twenty-three-year-old get into property investment? What, as opposed to a twenty-two-year-old, exactly, yeah. twenty-four-year-old? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I don't make up the question. Yeah. Maybe, but. So, um, I for me, it still starts with get a little single layer, learn how to buy cheaply, how to refurbish it, how to get it remortgaged and get it let out. Um, you know, I, I think it just starts with those basic building blocks, and then maybe move on to a HMO. Yeah. Um, you know, and learn the basic facets of, yeah. of buying at the right money, you know, refurbing and, and doing the, the correct items in the house, you know, whilst keeping the cost down and then yeah. getting it managed properly, probably with a, an external letting agency yeah. and, and dealing with all the mortgage and all that sort of stuff. And I, I just think going through the steps yeah. one by one, um, you know, buying one property at a time and then scaling up from there, if you can start when you're 20, 23, I mean, that's yeah. got to be a great time mm. because... By the time you're, you're at our age, you're going to have a, a good portfolio. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think I'd add something to that because Mark and I have been inspired by one of Mark's friends' dad and I thought it was a great strategy and we're definitely going to do this with our kids. So what Mark's friend's dad did was did a deal with his son and guaranteed and got him a property um, and covered the mortgage and said, you've got to go and rent out all the rooms or you can go and rent out all the rooms and you pay me the mortgage and the rest is profit. And I thought, what a great way to get into property. So if you want to leave home as an 18 or 23 year old, or you want to go to uni, you get that house, you rent out all the rooms, you learn on the job, you learn about dealing with tenants, business with friends, because that's a, a thing to learn. Learn about managing the money, you make some profit, and, and you know, you've kind of been backed by your, pe your parents, but you've not been spoon fed by your parents. So that's something I think a young person can do. And if you're watching and you've got a child who's coming up to sort of those late teens, early 20s, that's something you can do with them as a sort of joint venture that isn't a gift. Because, you know, you don't want to be silver spooning your, your kids because I don't think that that's going to raise them to be disruptive entrepreneurs. All right, Mark, what are your top three tips on using content to grow a small business? Probably not one for me, is it? Oh, should I start? Yeah, I think you, yeah. So um, there's in the in the world of marketing, content marketing is known as giving good value, uh, as so that people can use this information tangibly to improve their life, to build a brand that you give great value, and then you have follow-on products or services that they can buy. So you know we make no secret about this. You're very much connected to us in the community, and we tell you we we show you what we do as well as doing it. So my podcast and these live feed videos and the co contributions Mark and I do the, to the community and the books, which, you know, obviously less than a tenner, that might be our content marketing. Um, and the, and what we're, our attempt, we are attempting to give you so much good information that you can use that you go, I love these guys and I love what they're about. And then you might explore our further products and services. So that's like content marketing. So um, there's loads of ways we do that. But obviously the podcast is a very um, new, no, it's not new, but it's new to most people. So podcast, Mark, you, you know, he might make a post every one or two weeks, but he gets hundreds of likes and hundreds of comments because, you know, his, his information is valuable, on point, interesting and rare and unique. So creating great, rare and unique content. I think if your content is unique and what you do is different from the others, that can really help. 
obviously this live feed and this community that we're uh, feeding out to is another great way to create uh, uh, get content out to the masses because if you like this you can share this and then other people can see it and we can leverage our time because the reason Mark and I are doing this is for the for our PR company because they're having an article written for just entrepreneurs but we're live feeding this so you can get the benefit too and then Harry and Tom are recording this so we can use this in the future maybe on an online course or put it on YouTube so with content if you repurpose it but we've actually got two live feed cameras there we've got two physical cameras this is going to be transcribed, sent to Just Entrepreneurs. We'll probably use it as a blog. So we've got like five different ways we can repurpose this content. That's at least three. There we go. All right, number nine, Mark. How would you define an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is somebody who creates a business uh, and becomes responsible for their own income. So um, I think an entrepreneur is, is somebody who's always looking for an opportunity, an opportunity to... to, to to, to, to make money from something and to turn something into, um, you know, something that adds value for other people mm. so they're willing to pay money for it and therefore you, you make a profit. Um, entrepreneurs are opportunists yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're generally sort of, they probably don't sit still. Uh, they're, they're probably always on to the next thing. Uh, very active, probably put themselves under quite a lot of pressure. Um, but um, yeah, the, the entrepreneurs are a breed that the, the, the economy and, and our community need yeah. in order to, to, to maintain a, a sort of thriving business community and to provide jobs and create new industries and innovate and iterate and, yeah. and, and grow the, help grow the economy. Fund the public sector, for well, example. It's all, it's all funded by the private sector, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I'd, I'd agree with all of that and I'd add that we're problem solvers. So, you know, yet we're looking for an opportunity, of course. Now, if we balance making money for ourselves with giving great service to others, I think that's the sweet spot of being an entrepreneur. If you just focus on you, it's a bit greedy. If you just focus on others, it's a hobby and you're helping people, but you're not paying your mortgage and your overheads. So it's balancing, solving a meaningful problem. You know, like look at Uber, look at Airbnb. The entrepreneur makes. Um, because it's enough worth to pay yourself enough versus external worth to give people enough value equals your net worth. And yeah, often we get ourselves busy and we change our mind a lot and we want to do everything and we want to change the world and we're a little bit crazy and we're a little bit misunderstood. Uh, but that's what the, also the beauty of it. All right, so penultimate question. Thanks for tuning in. If you're live, we're going to do a second one, but we're going to stop this before we go on to the second one because it's a different piece of content, so stay with us. All right, so number 10, Mark. If you could have anyone record the voice message on your mo mobile, who would it be and why? Anyone record the voice message on my mobile? Well, it would be me, uh, because I want people to hear me and leave a, a relevant message if you know, I, I need to get back to them. I'm not sure why it would be anyone but me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. that's the honest answer. I've never thought about that ever in my whole life. Um, I'd quite like Arnold Schwarzenegger to record my, my message and I'd like him to say things about me in his accent and of course, you know, the quote about the chopper and I'll be back at the end. So that's mine, which is a slightly better answer than yours, I mean. All right, and number 11, what's the plan for Progressive over the next 12 months? Grow Progressive organically, do what we've done for the last 10 years and keep adding you know, money onto the top line, keep, keep bringing, you know, more money onto the bottom line, um, probably employ more staff, we're clearly developing more buildings, um, so yeah, just, just, just grow it as we have for the last mm. 10 years and as we'll be doing for the next 20 years. And uh, what I would add to that is, in the past we've seen growth as doing new things, and that's the entrepreneur's blessing and curse, we're good at creating but we're also good at doing too many things. Spinning too many plates, overwhelmed, shiny penny, I'm sure you can relate to it all. So sometimes next year, or this year from when you're planning last year, the best thing to do is what you did last year, but 20% more or 20% better. And that's a lesson I've got in business over the years that I wasn't good at. Mark was good at that. Mark, like, he'll change reticently. I'll stay the same reticently. And I think we've helped each other with that. So mostly, same again, continue to contribute, continue to build the community, continue to buy properties, continue to give you good products and services and improve all the products and services we have 
and launch a couple of new ones too. Uh, some of them are secrets. So I don't want to tell you them just now. All right, so that's the end of the interview for Just Entrepreneurs. I hope you found that useful. Thanks for coming in live. Stay with us, though, because we're going to do the next live feed video, and we're going to share a load of mistakes we've made in business over the last decade. So I'm <coughs> sure you'll enjoy that. So scroll on the page uh, for a video coming in the next 30 seconds or so.